Thanks very much, Christine, and, and thanks for the invitation. It's uh, always a great pleasure to uh, speak at these meetings and uh, welcome everyone, uh, especially anyone from outside of Canberra. Uh, you're getting the full experience this morning with the, uh, the mist uh, and, the, and the chilliness now clearing to a beautiful uh, almost winter's day. So um, I'm going to talk um, about um, two broad things uh, about treatment for uh, primary immune deficiency uh, and then I'm going to talk about the activities of our centre uh, and these are two closely related topics for reasons which I hope will unfold during the talk. Um, so if we go back to the beginning of um, primary immune deficiency, which is surprisingly not that long ago, um, uh, was an um, astute observation made by a clinician in the United States, a paediatrician who'd been observing um, a number of um, young boys within the first few years of life who were presenting with recurrent infections, predominantly chest infections. Um, and of course, this was in the 1950s when um, the available tests were uh, relatively limited. Um, but around about that time, there had been some insights made into the nature of proteins in, uh, in serum. Uh, and uh, he uh, observed that when the serum from these boys was analysed, uh, just by a simple um, electrophoresis, just separating the proteins in the lab in a gel according to their size, there was a fraction of that protein that was missing. That was the gamma globulin fraction. So he um, inferred from this that that missing fraction uh, was possibly connected to these boys having recurrent infections. And so this was called a gamma globulinemia because the missing fraction uh, was gamma globulin. And the, and the, and the clinician um, was uh, this, this chap, Ogden Bruton, um, a, a, um, a, a doctor and also a um, um, military man. So, um, so this was the first um, primary immune deficiency really to be characterised um, and to be named. So this was the first description of primary antibody deficiency. Um, and, and what Bruton was describing was essentially a congenital antibody deficiency. So this is an antibody deficiency that comes on early in life because um, these boys were, um, had an immune system that uh, precluded produ production of their own antibodies. Now this condition, uh, some of you may be aware, doesn't begin um, on the day of birth because um, in the first few, uh, few months of life we rely on the antibody that's transferred from our mother's uh, circulation. And so the, uh, the neonate survives on maternal antibody for several months and then gradually that dissipates and uh, in normal children the um, antibody production increases, um, but in, in these boys it fails and so uh, antibody deficiency becomes obvious within the first year or so of life. So that was the first description and, um, uh, and, and that led the way to uh, the gradual elucidation of, or, or, or recognition at least, of other forms of antibody deficiency, not only those that um, begin in the first year of life, but uh, those that can occur somewhat surprisingly at almost any stage of life. And as David um, Fulcher elucid, uh, described earlier this morning, uh, there is a spectrum of um, antibody deficiencies from those which are quantitative, where there's an absolute deficiency in the amount of antibody in the serum, uh, through to qualitative ones where mm, we can measure the antibody um, and uh, the levels apparently are normal, but there is the wrong type of antibody. Uh, so we just need to uh, define these terms a little bit more because uh, Bruton had recognised that um, these boys had a gamma globulinemia. Now I've just been talking about antibodies um, and we've got this other term, immunoglobulin, and they're essentially synonymous. 
So uh, it just describes different ways in which uh, these, the same thing was discovered. So the gamma globulin was discovered as a fraction of all of the proteins in the serum. Uh, immunoglobulin uh, is a term that uh, was arrived at once the structure of the gamma globulin was worked out. And, um, and if we think in functional terms, then immunoglobulin um, uh, is um, the molecular basis for antibodies, this crucial component of uh, normal immune defence. Um, but the, the thing about um, antibodies is this uh, remarkable diversity. And so um, this is probably an underestimate, but 10 to the power of 9 different specificities within the antibody. This is within all of us. And so the antibodies that we have circulating in our blood can recognise more than 10 to the power of 9 um, different molecules. And another remarkable thing is that this is all uh, this has evolved so that it operates on a just-in-case basis. So if someone devises a new molecule in the laboratory, they build a new chemical that hasn't existed on Earth before, the immune system will still recognise it. If, um, you know, if, if, a, if a bug landed from outer space, um, the immune system would normally still be able to recognise this. This is the extent of diversity within the antibody repertoire, which is, which is a remarkable thing. So um, uh, I think you've probably, this is probably just reiterating um, some of what David has already uh, mentioned, but um, when we take uh, some blood, um, then uh, the main constituents of blood are uh, the cellular constituents and the plasma. And they're all mixed up here. If, you, if this is fresh out of the person who's just had the veni puncture um, and, it, and, it's, and it's red because the predominant cell type are the red blood cells. But if we sit that on the bench for a while, the red blood cells will fall, all of the cells will fall to the bottom of the tube and we'll be left with the plasma which is the fluid in which all of the cells are suspended. Uh, plasma and serum are very similar. Um, uh, both are terms which describe this uh, fluid in which all of the cells sit. All right, so we've got the red blood cells, which are the ma major con um, uh, um, cellular uh, constituent. Uh, but then there are the white blood cells, and it's the white blood cells that we're interested in when we're talking about how the immune system works. And then the white blood cells can be further subclassified into various other types of white blood cells, neutrophils and monocytes. And the, and the cells of the immune system that we're particularly interested in are the lymphocytes. And then the lymphocytes can be subsetted further into B cells and T cells. And um, immunologists can then subset these further and further. And so um, we can readily identify um, many, many types of uh, subtypes of, of cells circulating in the blood. Now, um, some of you will be aware that not all antibody deficiencies arise through, um, um, arise through a primary problem in the way the immune system works. Sometimes, unfortunately, immune deficiencies arise as a consequence of various forms of treatment or as a complication of some other sort of condition. Um, and this is largely because um, these treatments aim, are aimed at affecting those circulating white blood cells. Uh, so some individuals who have not immune deficiency but um, inflammatory disorders where the immune system is unregulated in some way receive medicines that suppress the activity of the white blood cells. Or sometimes if we're treating people who have uh, various forms of cancer, we aim to reduce the cancer cells, but the white blood cells are particularly 
susceptible to the actions of those uh, treatments as well. So there are a variety of ways in which antibody deficiency can arise even if it's not a primary problem within the immune system. Okay, so it means that we have a number of different reasons why someone might be antibody deficient. Um, and at the moment, if someone is antibody deficient uh, and the severity of that antibody deficiency is sufficient to predispose to infection, then we consider some form of immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So uh, this is a recent analysis um, of the um, distribution of conditions for which people are receiving immunoglobulin replacement um, in Australia. And you can see that common variable immune deficiency, CVID, um, is the major indication. Uh, but there are many different conditions uh, for which people receive immunoglobulin. These are the primary immune deficiencies. All right, so if we go back in history again, uh, shortly after this observation was made by Bruton that, um, that the gamma globulin fraction was crucial for um, providing host defence, um, people started to think about how that fraction might be isolated for therapeutic purposes. Um, and so the gamma globulin fraction uh, became possible to uh, isolate that gamma globulin fraction from the plasma and make it available for therapeutic uh, purposes. And the first, the first uh, products that became available in the 1960s uh, were for intramuscular injection. And uh, this was um, turned out to probably be better than nothing. Um, um, X-linked A gamma globulinemia left untreated uh, leads to such a severe predisposition to infections that those boys seldom survived beyond their 20s um, because of uh, recurrent pneumonia leading to chronic lung damage and and, um, and ultimately respiratory failure. So the possibility of having a therapy um, that replaced that missing gamma globulin was, uh, was significant, uh, but, um, but it wasn't a pleasant therapy. Uh, the volume that was necessary to replace the missing um, uh, immunoglobulin was substantial and being given by intramuscular injection was very painful for these poor boys. And it didn't really um, uh, achieve uh, completely adequate replacement either. And so um, in the 1980s, intravenous immunoglobulin became, um, became available uh, due to a number of technical um, uh, advances in the, uh, in the fractionation of plasma. And this represented a very significant advance on, um, on, uh, on, uh, on the product that was given by the intramuscular route. And of course, uh, although it required intravenous access, uh, once that was achieved, then um, that was uh, a more pleasant uh, um, route of administration for the patients than the, than the intramuscular injections. But uh, there was still considerable variability in the, in the products that were available. Um, some were, you know, according to the, the nature of the fractionation, there was considerable variability in the, um, for example, the salt content uh, and various other constituents of the products, which meant that um, sometimes uh, complications were observed from, from these treatments. And there was also a bit of uncertainty about the <coughs> spectrum of immunoglobulins that were present. Remember, when we're replacing immunoglobulin, you have to come back to that, that remarkable fact that I gave you earlier in the talk, this diversity of the normal repertoire, more than 10 to the 9 different specificities. And so, as well as just replacing the total quantity, we're attempting to replace that, that, that spectrum. All right, and as time went on, uh, the, uh, the manufacture of um, immunoglobulin became more reliable. Um, there was 
greater harmonisation of the um, of the procedures and uh, an expectation that uh, and greater knowledge really of of the mechanisms of the of the toxicities based on these constituent uh, components. All right, and then of course for immunoglobulin replacement, the most recent development has been subcutaneous uh, treatments and. Um, and this started to be evaluated in the 1990s um, and took quite some time for it to be uh, introduced into routine practice. And this, this, um, this, this was dependent on several things, um, including uh, the availability of uh, high concentration products. And of course, there was a considerable lead time to evaluate the efficiency of immunoglobulin replacement by the subcutaneous route because by the time this became available the imp uh, uh, intravenous products were really working pretty e effectively and so uh, everyone was very concerned that um, we didn't uh, replace a highly effective therapy with one which wasn't quite as good uh, even though it offered some advantages in terms of convenience. Well, in fact, um, uh, if anything, the subcutaneous route offers some advantages in terms of the efficacy of replacement, and so it has proceeded to uh, routine clinical use. Now, as many of you will be aware, it took a little while for uh, subcutaneous replacement to become um, available for routine clinical use in this country. Um, and uh, there was an announcement um, in, in 2013. After you know, a combination of, of, um, of factors, um, taking into account the clinical evidence, an evaluation of the health economics of this, uh, and making sure that people were aware of the um, importance of having um, this therapy available. And, you know, IDFA uh, and and um, and and um, and patients were very important in this lobbying exercise and 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 uh, the exercise of ensuring that the relevant people were aware of the um, importance of this treatment. So um, I think it was uh, overall um, a win for um, for changing uh, health policy based on sound scientific evidence and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the clinical need. Okay, so here in, uh, in Canberra we were able to get moving with uh, subcutane a subcutaneous program um, pretty soon after the treatment became available um, and, and, uh, and Anastasia has been, um, has been running this program um, with, with great efficiency and, and skill since then and I think that this has been, uh, this has been, this has been great for the, the, the other clinicians um, looking after patients and I think for many patients this has been a positive experience to have this available. All right, so there are some future uh, possibilities for immunoglobulin um, replacement um, uh, and and this is um, these are already in use in some parts of the world and uh, are likely to become available um, here uh, sometime within the next year or two, uh, where we might be able to reduce the frequency of um, subcutaneous replacement therapy using various strategies um, uh, based on particular. Uh, product compositions. Now, uh, so that's the that's a quick walkthrough of um, immunoglobulin replacement therapy, and this is the most um, prevalent um, uh, plasma-based therapy for for um, immune deficient primary immune deficiency because primary antibody deficiency is the most prevalent uh, form of primary immune deficiency. But there are others. There are individuals who uh, lack other specific proteins in their, uh, in, in their, in their plasma. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, a condition called hereditary angioedema where individuals have spontaneous episodes of 
angioedema or swelling of the tissues. This can affect their lips or eyes or internal organs. Um, so it can be a painful and potentially life-threatening um, condition. So it's a little bit like having an allergic reaction. You've seen individuals who have had severe reactions to bee stings. Well, this is a little bit like that, except that it occurs spontaneously. And this is uh, treatable with um, products uh, either purified from blood or, uh, or, um, or, uh, or manufactured. And complement uh, is another plasma protein which you've heard about from David, which uh, is also part of the normal host defence mechanisms. And there are some rare individuals who suffer from uh, complement deficiencies. Now, um, there is more to the immune system, though, than, uh, than, the, uh, than the circulating proteins. Um, as I mentioned before, if we just consider the cellular constituents of blood, then uh, even at the simplest level, we have a number of different uh, cellular components. And even within the lymphocyte compartment, we've got the B cells, which make the antibodies but then the T cells, which are responsible for another component of immunity. Now, um, sometimes my students, uh, uh, medical students in particular, um, complain a bit that the immune system is quite complicated and how are they possibly meant to learn all of this to a sufficient level to pass their exams. Um, so I show them this slide and say, well, here is the immune system in a single slide. This is all you need to know. Um, but, uh, but you need, do need to understand it in some detail. So it's not as hard as you think. Um, uh, but what this summarises is, um, is really uh, the fact that we have a body, we have various surfaces on our body, skin or the surface of our gut or the surface of our uh, in lining of our um, respiratory tract, and that's usually where we come into contact with an infectious organism. And uh, so this, this here, uh, antigen is another word for an infection that, or for, for a molecule that the immune system can recognise. And so then um, we've got this sort of um, sensing arm of the immune system where this threat from an infection is recognised. And so there are a variety of cells which patrol the body and the tissues looking for this threat. And then if that occurs, then here we've got our lymphocytes, our T cells and our B cells, which interact with one another to start to make a response to this threat. And so once this signal is received, then the T cells and the B cells are switched on, they work together, and then the B cells make antibodies and other signals come out of the T cells, and then they modify these other white blood cells, and these are the effector components. These are the cells which then go back to deal with this, um, with this bug, which is potentially going to cause a problem. All right, so I'm being uh, slightly facetious in saying that it's all that simple, because right here we've already got quite a number of components. But, uh, but the crucial thing is just to understand that overall, um, the task of the immune system is relatively simple. Recognise that infectious threat and deal with it. Oops. All right. So, um, so primary immune deficiencies um, have now been described which compromise almost every component of the immune system. So I've spoken so far primarily about those, those problems that affect the antibody arm of the immune system, and that's the B cells which make the antibodies. But, and, and, and here is a survey of primary immune deficiencies within Australia, and about three quarters of all primary immune deficiencies um, uh, consist of antibody defects. 
but uh, but there are um, there are a significant number of other forms of immune deficiency, and um, and we now know, and I'll go on to this a little bit later. We now know that there are of the order of um, three hundred and twenty specific forms of primary immune deficiency. So if we think about treatment for primary immune deficiency, antibody replacement is one component, but it's not always sufficient. If there is a problem with another component of the immune system, such as the T cells, the other major subset of lymphocytes, then those individuals present in a different way and they can't be just treated with uh, immunoglobulin replacement. Now, just like X-linked day gamma globulinemia, um, T cell deficiency usually presents early in life, and often it presents within the first few months of life. Um, and this is really a very severe condition. So these babies present with um, a failure to thrive, um, and then they have various uh, signs of infections, which we just don't normally see in in in, in healthy children. So, uh, so thrush, but really refractory thrush, and then types of pneumonia due to organisms that we don't see in individuals with normal immune systems. And so. Um, we now uh, start to have some idea about um, where the problem is in these individuals. And so here we've just got a simple scheme of how the different types of lymphocytes are differentiated from one another. So we've got a precursor cell, which then can differentiate into T cells or B cells or other subsets. And then the T cells can form further subsets. And there are a variety of of um, uh, problems that can arise during this normal lymphocyte development uh, to give rise to this condition called severe combined immune deficiency, uh, where the manifestations are primarily down to the absence of a normal T cell population. And so um, because the problem here is uh, the absence of the normal T cells, the T cells haven't developed normally from these precursors, uh, these um, young children really require a cellular uh, therapy, a replacement of their immune system. And um, effectively, this can be achieved at the moment either through a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant. And so that's the way we uh, manage uh, these children at the moment. Now, severe combined immune deficiency is, uh, is, is, is very rare. Well, it's not very rare, it's quite rare. So it, it affects about um, uh, one in um, 60 or 70,000 uh, children. And you may be aware, because this is another activity that is, uh, uh, is um, underway at the moment to modify policy, is that there in a number of countries at the moment, screening for severe combined immune deficiency on the Guthrie card has been implemented. But it doesn't exist in Australia at the moment. Um, and there's a very solid case for having that in place. And so um, advocacy for that is, uh, is uh, something that you may be aware of, and certainly within the immunological community, we're working quite, quite hard to try and uh, get that implemented. Because it makes a big difference. The earlier the diagnosis is achieved, uh, the better the outcome. There's very solid evidence for that, that if we can identify these babies before they develop uh, infective complications, then their outcome is much better. All right, so here is the overview of treatment that I've told you about so far. We've got, um, we've got um, uh, immunoglobulin replacement for um, antibody deficiency. Uh, the antibody deficiency arises as a problem with the cells. In the case of antibodies, this is a problem with the B cells. But there can be other cellular problems in the immune system, and sometimes we can't replace the products of the cells, we have to try and replace those cells themselves, and that's with bone marrow or stem cell. 
Um, but what about, uh, what about even further upstream? Uh, if we could identify the problems that uh, go wrong within an individual's uh, genetic makeup, perhaps, then could we, um, could we arrive at uh, e even a, another form of treatment to overcome immune deficiency? All right, so let's return now to uh, the, original, uh, the original case, the, 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 um, the case of uh, Bruton's A gamma globulinemia. Remember, this was made with uh, very, uh, this diagnosis was made on the basis of very crude tools in the 1950s. By the 1980s and 1990s, a lot of progress had been made in understanding uh, immunoglobulin molecules. And it had been worked out in great detail what the structure of immunoglobulin is. And, um, and we worked out that immunoglobulin is not only in the circulation, but it also sits on the surface of the B cells, the cells that ultimately make immunoglobulin, sits on their surface as their receptor. And then um, further progress was made. Um, in understanding how that receptor works, how it delivers a signal to the B cell to make the B cell get activated and, um, and start to make more immunoglobulin. And part of the signal, uh, the signaling apparatus is very complicated, um, but what was discovered by going back to look at some of those boys with X-linked A gamma globulinemia was that the problem in all of those boys arose from uh, a dysfunctional protein in one of these signalling molecules just inside the cell. And the, and the, and the, um, and the people who made that discovery um, identified this, this particular enzyme and they called it, in deference to, uh, to, to Bruton, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. So they called the enzyme after the clinician who described this syndrome in the first place. All right, so the, this is now getting quite complicated um, and I won't dwell on this too much, but it, I just want to make the point, that, you know, over the course of um, 30, 35 years, um, we went from describing the very first form of primary immune deficiency to identifying the precise molecule that goes wrong in these children. You could look at it the other way and say, wow, it took 35 years, right? This is, this is how long it takes to do this sort of thing. So, you know, progress is sometimes, is sometimes slow, but, but it gave us a lot of insights. And then it was worked out that there were some kids with A-gamma globulinemia that, that didn't actually have a, a problem with BTK, but it turns out that the same clinical presentation can occur with problems in other, um, in other proteins. And they're all part of the same complex. Uh, so at the clinical level, they look very similar, and then when we drill right down on the molecules that are going wrong, they're very similar as well. Okay, so if we think about how, um, how we all work, then um, this, is, this is the fundamental rule, that, um, that we have proteins like immunoglobulins and like Bruton's tyrosine kinase and, uh, and, and lots of other things. And these proteins are all uh, specified in our genetic makeup. Um, and a gene is initially written into another molecule called RNA, which is similar to the genes, which are made up of DNA. And these are the codes these are, the, these are the plans for specifying how the protein looks. So if we're thinking about how we can move even further back in the process to understand what's going on, at the moment I've told you about how we can work out uh, where the protein problems might be, but we now need to think about whether we can start to understand how the genes go wrong. All right, so just, just to a little bit of... Um, uh, further background, all of our body is made up of cells, different cells and all of the different tissues in the body. I've told you about some of the cells of the immune system. And all of our cells, almost all of our cells within their nucleus have chromosomes, same set of chromosomes, and then 
on the chromosome, if we drill down even further, the chromosomes are made up of DNA. And the DNA consists of this sequence of Gattaca, right? G, C, T and A. That's it. Right? It all comes down to that. Now, here are our, here are our 46 chromosomes. So this is, this is the content of any cell. And, um, and, uh, and, 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 and the information here is really enormous. So, so we just take one of these chromosomes, chromosome 5, then on chromosome 5 we've got 900 genes, 180 million G, C, T's and A's. So there's enormous... So this is the content of every cell in the body and, um, and our genetic makeup is uh, really substantial. And so all of this goes together if we take all of the chromosomes and, and, and say, well, how many genes do we have overall? Well, it's about 20,000 genes overall and about 3 billion G, C, T's and A's. That's in all of us, in every one of our cells. So here's this fundamental uh, relationship. So the DNA, which is made up of these 3 billion G, C, T's and A's, specifies how proteins are made. And proteins are made up of amino acids, 20 different, different amino acids. So the sequence of those G, C, T's and A's, every three G, C and T's determines a particular amino acid. And then the proteins are built from those amino acids. So that's how the DNA determines the structure of the protein. Now, every time um, our cells divide, and a lymphocyte divides every six hours or so, the entire genetic content has to be replicated. And so all three billion bases are replicated for the next cell. Well, when a cell divides from one into two cells, that's what happens. Um, so this is incredible. And, 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 and so... Um, this happens in most cells in the body. Some cells divide more than others. Um, but it also happens in our germ cells. So in the sperm and in the ova, the same process occurs. And then um, the genetic content is split into two. And then at fertilization of the egg, the complete genetic complement is restored. OK, so every time a cell divides, uh, three billion bases have to be replicated, and so sometimes an error arises. Um, and we can measure this, we can measure this uh, error rate. It's very small, but it occurs. And if there is an error in the DNA, so if instead of having an A within this content of G, C, T's and A's, so we have a C. So instead of having an A, C, C, we all of a sudden have a C, 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 then this specifies not one particular amino acid, a threonine, but a different amino acid, a proline. And so the protein has been changed. Now sometimes that doesn't matter, but sometimes it's catastrophic. One out of three billion can sometimes be significant. All right, now we know that there is a significant contribution to, a significant genetic contribution to many diseases, perhaps all diseases, it varies a little bit from condition to condition. And if we think about primary immune deficiency, then uh, we have reasonably compelling evidence for um, a genetic contribution when we see a family like this. This is a, this is a sort of diagram that doctors will draw to summarize um, how a condition runs in a family, right? So the squares are the males and the circles are the females and these are successive generations and this pair of, um, of, uh, of, of, um, have had uh, these children in the next generation and you can see that the symbols which are coloured in black are to signify that all of these individuals within this family have the same medical condition. So we see a, see a kindred like this, then we can be pretty sure that there's uh, something more than uh, chance arising from an environmental exposure to account for this condition uh, running in the family. 
and that obviously points to a strong genetic contribution. But as many of you will be aware, sometimes um, we are dealing with a kindred which looks more like this, where there's only one person in the family who has the condition. And we think, well, how can that arise? Um, you know, why is this one person so unlucky as to get the condition when everyone else seems to be okay? Uh, surely uh, that, can't be, that can't be genetic. Well, it doesn't rule it out. But, um, there are various reasons why why this can still be just as um, strongly genetically specified as, uh, as a condition in this kindred. Um, but the, the thing is that it's a bit easier for us to work out which gene might be responsible when we're dealing with a family like this because we can, we've got many different individuals we can, we can analyse rather than dealing with one like this. And in fact, until very recently, we had no chance at all, virtually, of trying to resolve um, what was going on in an individual like this. Now we can now, and, and so now I'm just going to say a little bit about what we do at the Centre for Personalised Immunology, the CPI, which, where we're interested in trying to elucidate the mechanism of immunological diseases particularly trying to work out what's going on at the genetic level and then understanding how genes alter proteins and proteins alter the function of cells to ultimately get us back to how we might come to new approaches to treatment. Right, so, so my contribution to the CPI is predominantly in a primary immune deficiency, but some of my colleagues work on autoimmune diseases like lupus and Sjogren's, and then there are some other um, unusual inflammatory conditions. Now, uh, this is not a very clear distinction, and some of you will be aware that, um, um, that primary immune deficiency is sometimes associated with autoimmunity as well. Right? So some people with antibody deficiency also get autoimmune problems. Um, and so we used to think that, uh, you know, immune deficiency was due to a weakness of the immune system and autoimmunity was overactive, overactivity of the immune system, but that was a, that was a huge oversimpl oversimplification of what's really going on. And they're often conditions of um, uh, dysregulation. Okay, and so we started... Um, even before the CPI was formulated, we'd established this um, cohort called the ANZADA uh, cohort of, of patients with primary antibody deficiency. And this is a, this is a large national uh, effort to uh, understand what, of course, is a relatively uncommon condition. All right, so it's become possible to start to sort out what's going on even in those kindreds where there might only be one person who's affected because of technological developments and this is especially um, in, uh, in, in gene sequencing. So it used to take um, a long time and, and cost quite a bit to sequence even a single gene and as I've told you the genome is made up of about 20,000 genes. But it's now feasible for us to sequence all 20,000 genes and indeed we can sequence the entire genome, all 3 billion bases, um, um, without, um, without it taking too long. Uh, and so the problem is no longer actually identifying genetic variation to understand disease. The problem is, is uh, in fact, uh, that we all have so much genetic variation and we have to try and work out which genetic variants might be the problem. Okay, so it comes back to this thing that there is this certain amount of error that occurs that creeps in every time a cell divides and, some, and the same thing occurs in the germ cells and so um, there's always some genetic variation. Um, I'll skip over. That's a bit complicated. So, so, so if we sequence, um, if we sequence someone's um, twenty thousand genes, then we'll arrive at um, a lot of information. At a minimum, we'll have all of those G's, A's, C's, and T's, T's who that 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 make up the twenty thousand genes. 
and we have to start to make sense of that. Now, now to begin with, the sequencing proceeds by just doing runs of about 100 of those GCs, GCTs and As. And then we have to match that to the, to the known sequence of the human genome. So we've got all of these little fragments of 100 bases in length, and we've got to, it's like this giant jigsaw puzzle. We've got to see where they sit within the three billion bases. Match them up to the complementary sequence in the three billion bases. So this is a significant computational task, and it takes place, if you look out the window, there's another building just across there, and that's the, that's the national computational infrastructure, and inside there is this, which is the largest supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere. Rianjin. So that's where we do that, where that computational task is performed. And, and then we can start to characterise, once we've lined up all of those bits of DNA, then we can start to work out where the, where the variations are. And we all have lots of variation in our, in our genome. If we compared the genome of everyone in this room, um, then we differ from one another um, at about mm, 20,000 places. And so there are some variants that, um, that we all have in our genomes, uh, or, or many of us have, and there are some which are extremely rare. And so over time, we're starting to get a catalogue of all of this genetic variation. So that's the next computational task that we have to perform to try and see if we've looked at someone's genome and we find a variant, is it present in lots of people or has it never been seen before? Because if it's never been seen before, it's a bit more likely that that might be the one that's caused the problem than if that particular variant is present in lots of people. Nevertheless, it's still a huge task to try and work out um, what's going on. So this is I'm trying to summarise it here. So we've got you know genetic information coming out here, and what we're saying is we gather an enormous amount of precise information, lots of different. Uh, if, if every one of these little dots here is uh, is, a, is a base in the genome, then we might identify these variants. But then, how do we relate that back to the diagnosis? Um, and especially uh, when the diagnosis is uh, sometimes not completely uh, precise. We've heard already that, um, that some individuals, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty about what their diagnosis might actually be. Uh, so, so we've, got, we've somehow got to, uh, got to resolve this. Uh, and, and, and one way that we can try and do it is to relate the genetic variation back to the changes in the blood cells, not only to how the person's presented, so we might not uh, just concentrate on the history of infection, but we might be able to relate the genetic variation back to precise variation in the white blood cells. And that gives us a, a link to try and um, sort out what might be taking place. And so for those of you who have been participating in, um, in CPI-related studies, then you'll be aware that sometimes we say, oh, would you mind having a little bit of extra blood taken? And, um, and that's uh, often so that we can do some further functional studies on these white blood cells and see if we can find any, any changes in those white blood cells that we wouldn't normally expect to see. And then we can, and then we can relate those changes potentially back to back to um, changes in the genome. Now, if we're analysing the white blood cells, we use another fancy machine, and uh, that's to characterise uh, the lymphocytes in, in in considerable detail. And we do that by identifying molecules on the surface of the white blood cells. And um, I don't need to go into it in too much detail. But again, we get lots of data, and this is something that David concentrates on in the CPI, um, where we can identify all of these different sorts of lymphocytes. Uh, and then sometimes we can find that there are particular subsets which 
are often missing in people with particular forms of immune deficiency which are present in, uh, in, in individuals who don't have immune deficiency. All right, almost there. So, um, so we get all of this information and, um, and often we can posture, we can formulate a hypothesis about which genetic variation might actually be responsible for um, causing immune deficiency. But, um, but we can easily be misled um, because, um, because of the amount of data that we have and because of this problem of the extent of genetic variation from person to person. So ultimately, we really need to try and prove that there is a direct causal relationship between uh, a particular uh, single genetic variation and a change in the immune system. And, um, and in the past um, five years or so, it's become possible to do this in, in, in the laboratory uh, using this gene editing technology, uh, which is actually um, which is actually the part of part of the host defence mechanisms of um, of other organisms, but um, but we can harness this now uh, for um, editing uh, editing the the genes uh, within uh, say a, a cell that we that we're growing in culture or indeed uh, in a mouse um, to try and understand what's going on. And so the, 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 what happens here is that we can take um, a particular gene that we think might be responsible and look at a particular one of those bases, one of the A, C, T's and G's, uh, that we think might have resulted in a critical change in the function of that gene and therefore in the protein that's encoded and introduce that change into a cell line that's, that's growing in the laboratory or indeed into a mouse, and then see whether introducing that change actually brings about um, the changes in the function of the cell or the, the protein that we're interested in. And, um, and we'll hear a little bit of more of an example of this um, from uh, Chalisa in a minute. Okay, so all of this means that, um, that uh, we can now uh, go back one further step uh, where we can think about um, if there is a cellular abnormality, we can define that very precisely. Um, and then we can often um, start to identify the gene that's gone wrong to cause that cellular abnormality. And, um, and then this opens up uh, further forms of treatment, uh, some of which exists and some of which may exist in the future. So gene therapy is where um, one of these uh, genetic abnormalities is identified. And so for some of the children with severe combined immune deficiency, uh, this has already been in place. So in SCID, uh, what can happen is that uh, this, instead of um, a bone marrow transplant occurring from another individual, the cells from the, from the child which, with SCID uh, taken out, and the missing gene, the gene which is defective, is um, is, um, is is corrected essentially by putting in a good version of that gene, going back into the patient's own cells, and then the cells go back in, and then those cells can differentiate normally to reconstitute their immune system. So that's the sort of gene therapy that exists at the moment, and you'll probably be aware just from the popular press that there is a lot of interest in the possibility of correcting or editing uh, genetic abnormalities that might lead to these other problems. Now, there's, this is a very big topic. There are obviously lots of implications of, of starting to edit the genome. Um, but um, but uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which we can use at the moment for the purposes of sorting out what's going on, uh, it or related technology has the potential to, uh, uh, to lead to editing, gene editing as a therapy sometime in the future. 
All right, so I will stop there. I'd just like to acknowledge that, um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the members of my laboratory who are working so hard on this, and you'll hear from one of them, Chalisa Cardenas, in a minute, but um, I have an excellent laboratory of, um, of, uh, of young researchers working very hard on all of this all the time. And Anastasia Wilson not only runs the SCIG program, but is also instrumental in, uh, in a lot of the activities that we do um, at the CPI, uh, together with Anne-Marie Hatch. And then my co-senior investigators at the, um, at the CPI are listed here. And we have support uh, from the Harvey Foundation uh, and from the NHMRC.